Reverend James B. Ramsey was the pastor of the Lynchburg, Virginia Presbyterian Church. The following is part of a sermon that he preached on May the 24th, 1863, after the death of his friend, Stonewall Jackson. Listen to what he says. Thus walking with God in prayer and holy obedience, he reposed, Jackson did, upon God's promises and providence with a calm and unflinching reliance beyond any man I ever knew. I shall never forget the manner and tone of surprise and childlike confidence with which he spoke to me once on this subject. It was just after the election in November of 1860, when this country was beginning to heave with the agony and the throes of dissolution. We had just risen from morning prayers in his own house, where at the time I was his guest. Filled with gloom, I was lamenting in strong language the condition and prospects of our beloved country. Why, said General Jackson, should Christians be at all disturbed about the dissolution of the Union? It can only come by God's permission and will only be permitted if for his people's good. For does he not say that all things shall work together for good to them that love God? I cannot see why we should be distressed about such things, whatever be their consequences. Nothing seemed ever to shake General Jackson's faith in God. It was in him a truly sublime and all-controlling principle. In the beautiful language of this psalm, he dwelt in the secret place of the Most High. He made the Most High his habitation and was thus placed on high from the fear of evil. Together with that extreme fear of offending God in even the least thing, which was the only fear that Stonewall Jackson ever knew, that made him the model soldier and a true Christian hero. Ladies and gentlemen, General Stonewall Jackson believed in the prevailing purposes of God. And for that reason, he feared no circumstances at all in his life. If you and I today are sure that God is in control, then you and I can live stress-free lives. And I believe that's the will of God for us. I want to leave you with Proverbs 19.21. It says, Many are the plans that are in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that will prevail. This is Brother Paxton from Lexington, Virginia. God bless you. You know, in the Word of God, it tells us that we're in a warfare. And in that warfare, one of the key strategies is the enemy always wants to seek the high ground. It's when you have control of the high ground that you had control as you can see behind us, if you had the high ground, no one could approach you without you being able to see it. And the Bible says that we're to cast down every thought, every high thought or imagination that sets itself against the Word of God. And we as believers need to understand that the high ground in our life is our thought life and what we think about. The Scripture says that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So I think it's very important for us to understand that through the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit, we can control our thinking and have our thinking in line with the Word of God that we can walk our life out in agreement with what God's Word says. That we can have the high ground so that we can have victory in our life by controlling what we think and having our thoughts controlled by the Word of God and by the Spirit of God. And this is the way that we can walk in victory as we control the high ground. God bless you. Praise the Lord, everybody. This is Brother Paxton, and I'm coming to you from the Blue Ridge Mountains near Lexington, Virginia. Today I want to read for a brief moment from Romans chapter 12, and I want to read verses 1 and 2 from the Expositor's New Testament. I'm going to read the scripture and then the notes, and I will indicate such to you. Scripture says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, in the notes it says, I beg of you please, by the mercies of God. Now all is given to the believer, not because of merit on the believer's part, but strictly because of the mercy of God. Scripture, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Notes, the word sacrifice speaks of the sacrifice of Christ 
and means that we cannot do this which the Holy Spirit demands unless our faith is placed strictly in Christ and the cross, which then gives the Holy Spirit latitude to carry out this great work within our lives. The scripture then uses the word holy, that which the Holy Spirit alone can do. Think about it a moment. A human being really cannot produce holiness. There's nothing in us that is holy. We are other than holy. We are flesh. So when, you, when you're reading the Word of God and you read the word holy, you don't need to act like it depends on you. Because this is only that which the Holy Spirit can do, make you holy. Also, the scripture says, acceptable unto God. This actually means that a holy physical body, a holy temple, is all that God will accept, which is your reasonable service. Reasonable if we look to Christ and the, and the cross. Otherwise, this is impossible. I want you to understand that today, child of God. Romans 12 and 1, to you is impossible if you look to yourself. But if you look to the work that Jesus finished on the cross, if you put your faith 100% completely in that alone, not in your confession, not in how much you read the Bible every day, not in how much you pray, not in how much you witness or give or any work that you do of yourself, but you look strictly to Christ, this goes from impossible to reality. You see, we've got to get from impossible to reality. And the entrance point to that is the cross. Now the second verse says this, Be not conformed to this world, the ways of the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. I think for so many years, we've had a misconception of that scripture. And we've thought that the renewing of our minds meant adding Bible information to our head. That's not what it means. You can sit here and read the word, but you know the scripture doesn't say, read the word? Scripture says, study to show yourself approved unto God. So it's as we study the word, the ways of God, it's as we place our faith in what Christ has done for us, the Holy Spirit renews the believer's mind. I wanna say that one more time. The Holy Spirit renews the believer's mind. We've thought that we have to do it. Just like we've thought that we have to do everything else and that God would be pleased with it. But no, it's the Holy Spirit that does the work. And the only thing that the Holy Spirit requires of us is faith. Faith. Now, faith will produce everything else that we need as Christians. Obedience, dedication, consecration. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit will put a want to in my life for all of these spiritual disciplines. That's called the renewing of the mind. That Holy Spirit want to is the renewing of the believer's mind. Let's read the note before we close out here today. Uh, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Note, we must start thinking spiritually, which refers to the fact that everything is furnished to us through the cross and is obtained by faith and not works. N scripture, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the will of God today. Brother Dennis O'Daniel's here with us on this trip, and he just preached a little while ago. Just gave a word, a right now word, that you need to learn to occupy the high ground. Hallelujah. We can do that as our faith is in the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. This is Brother Paxton from Lexington, Virginia, the Blue Ridge Mountain, saying, Go with God, and He will go with you. General Thomas Stonewall Jackson attended four years at West Point as an Army cadet before the Civil War. While at West Point, Jackson began to develop his strong sense of Christian character. As revealed in the pages of a private book he kept for his personal use, the rules, morals, manners, dress, choice of friends, and goals in life show the standards that Jackson had for his own conduct and character. Between 1842 and 1846, Stonewall Jackson wrote this, through life let your principal object 
be the discharge of duty. Disregard public opinion to be at peace with all men. Sacrifice your life rather than your word. Endeavor to do well everything which with you undertake. Never speak disrespectfully of anyone without a cause. Spare no effort to suppress selfishness unless that effort would entail sorrow. Let your conduct towards men have some uniformity. Speak only that which may benefit others or yourself, avoiding trifling conversation. I wish that some in the church today would hear that, avoiding trifling conversations. Resolve to perform what you ought. Perform without fail what you resolve. A man is known by the company he keeps. Be cautious in your selection, because there is the danger of catching the habits of your associates. Seek those who are intelligent and virtuous, and if possible, those who are a little above you, especially in moral excellence. Jackson's Christian character, humility, and confidence were shaped through his fear of God and reading the Bible. His creation of maxims for himself was evidence of his daily walk with the Lord. Through the wisdom and knowledge of God, Jackson chose to live a holy life governed by the Word of God and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. An old farmer in southern Indiana used to say, the Lord will provide the taters, but you got to dig them. If we are to acquire <clears throat> the characteristics that made Jackson great, then we have to be willing to work for them. Proverbs 9 verse 10 says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So from the Stonewall Jackson Cemetery in Lexington, Virginia, this is Brother Paxton saying, go with God, and He will go with you. This is Brother Paxton, everybody. I'm coming to you from the Stonewall Jackson Cemetery in Lexington, Virginia. On a Monday morning, General Thomas Stonewall Jackson wrote to his beloved wife, Mary Anna, speaking of the wonderful Sunday he had had the day before. He also told of bad weather conditions that brought great discomfort to the Southern armies. Here's what he said. Monday morning. This is a beautiful and lovely morning. Beautiful emblem of the morning of eternity in heaven. I greatly enjoy it after our cold, chilly weather which made me feel doubtful of my capacity, humanly speaking, to endure this campaign, should we remain long in tents. But God, our God, does and will do all things well. And if it is his pleasure that I should remain in the field, he will give me the ability to endure all its fatigues. I hope my little sunshiny face is as bright as this lovely day. Yesterday I heard, heard a good sermon from the chaplain of the 2nd Regiment and at night I went over to Colonel Garland's regiment of Longstreet's Brigade and heard an excellent sermon from the Reverend Mr. Granberry of the Methodist Church. All Christian, every Christian will experience weariness in their Christian walk at one time or another. See, Jackson was weary here and he was expressing that in a letter to his wife. Sometimes our wives hear about our weariness before anybody else does. All Christians will experience weariness in their Christian walk at one time or another. There was no exception for General Jackson. He thanked God for the lovely warm day after enduring so much cold, chilly weather that he had grown a little bit discouraged. He rejoiced in the beauty around him and gave praise to the Lord, who does all things well. Undoubtedly, he had endured long periods while campaigning in the field with his army. The beautiful morning that dawned was to him a glimpse of what heaven might be like. It came as a refreshing in his here and now, and so he equated it with what heaven may be like. Jackson believed that God would help him endure whatever hardships would come his way. Psalm 73 verses 2 through 17 is a good reading. Uh, for us when we find ourselves in hardships. And here's part of that verse. It says, But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant, 
as I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for there are no pains in their death. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight, until I came into the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end. And as we leave this little segment here, I'm going to have Angie pan around and Stonewall Jackson's monument is right behind us. As we remember the general today and as we remember the lessons that God would have us to learn from his life. Bless you. In 1860, a 43-year-old farmer named John Dye lived here with his wife Elizabeth, their four children, and six slaves. This 120-acre farm produced hay, corn, and wheat, and the family also had a few cows, horses, and mules. Two years later, the Battle of Perryville struck. Confederate General Simon Bolivar Buckner commandeered this house as his headquarters and most of the Confederate Army passed by this house as they deployed to attack the Union right flank, which was located about a mile in front of us. After the battle, the house was a hospital. Stains that appear to be blood stains still remain on the upstairs floor. Union troops remained at the house for several weeks after the battle. One day, the 17-year-old Martha Dye went upstairs to get some flour to bake bread. As she descended the stairs, a Union soldier refused to step aside to let her pass. Martha promptly dumped the flour over the soldier's head. Another soldier allegedly proposed marriage to the 15-year-old Ruth Dye, but she refused his proposal. Simon Bolivar Buckner was born in Hart County, Kentucky on April 12th of 1823. An 1844 West Point graduate, Buckner taught there for one year before serving in the Mexican War. Immediately before the Civil War, Buckner was an adjutant general of Kentucky and led the State Guard. Appointed Brigadier General in the Confederate Army, Buckner fought at Fort Donelson where he surrendered the Confederate Army after his superiors fled the fort. Captured there and later exchanged, Buckner negotiated the surrender of the Union garrison at Munfordville, Kentucky, before leading a division at Perryville. Later in the war, he fortified Confederate positions at Mobile, Alabama, and fought at Chickamauga. After the conflict, Buckner was the editor of the Louisville Courier and was elected governor of Kentucky in 1887. A vice presidential nominee in 1896, he died near Mumfordville, Kentucky on January 8, 1914. He is buried now in Frankfort, Kentucky. General Simon Bolivar Buckner, and this is the Dye House that served as his Confederate headquarters during the Battle of Perryville. Dozens of casualties were incurred here, and the regimental flag was, an officer wrote, literally riddled with the balls and the staff shot off. Union troops to the right broke under the weight of the rebel assault, and Simonson's battery fell 300 yards toward the Russell House. When the flank peeled away, the 38th Indiana was left alone without ammunition to face the attacking Confederates. Nearly cut off, they fell back toward the Russell House where they continued to fight. So right in here was where the regiment's flag was riddled with mini balls and the staff was shot off that flag. And yet they continued to fight all the way over to the Russell House, which I believe is right there. The 38th Indiana lost 38 killed, 132 wounded representing nearly 40% of their strength. After the battle, they buried the dead in the cornfield 
which I would presume would, would have been back uh, where most of the men had fallen. These remains were later moved to Camp Nelson National Cemetery in Jessamine County, Kentucky. The aftermath was traumatic. Sipe wrote that of all the horrible suffering, I hope I may never witness the like again. Union and Rebel lying side by side with their limbs blown off or shattered to pieces. One Rebel with both his arms blown off told me if he were in his grave, he would not be suffering the way he is right now. Henry Fales Perry of the 38th concurred. He wrote that the spectacle presented by the battlefield was enough to make angels weep.
We're here at the Battle of Perryville in Perryville, Kentucky. This is the spot of Donaldson's advance. When Donaldson's brigade moved into this valley right in front of us, they were met here with a deadly surprise. This rolling terrain had prevented the Confederates from seeing all of the Union troop positions out there. When the Confederates reached this valley, they became trapped in a deadly crossfire as Union artillery fired at them from both the west and the north. Shells exploded overhead and cannonballs crashed into the southern lines, but the brigade surged forward. Casualties were horrible from the crossfire and the accurate fire from the two Union batteries spun the southern troops into confusion. Donaldson's lines wavered here and changed directions twice. The unexpected artillery barrage nearly ended Donaldson's advance. Although the fire from two Union artillery batteries had killed and wounded dozens of soldiers and had caused chaos in the southern lines, the Confederates reformed here and continued their attack. Pressing the Union soldiers, Donaldson's brigade drove a Union infantry regiment out from behind a fence and continued westward up the valley. Donaldson's Advance, the Battle of Perryville, Perryville, Kentucky.